So welcome back to week number four of our venture capital class. Hello. Um, as you know, we have a guest speaker today, Mr. Ron Newmans. Um, what I wanted to say is that this is the kickoff of the uh, venture capital and entrepreneurial venture capital entrepreneurial finance lecture series of 2018. I've been doing this for a few years. You can actually see the old videos on the internet. Uh, it's for the first time also under the uh, auspices of the Center of, uh, Research. Auto of Research, Research yeah. Center of uh, Entrepreneurial Finance and uh, Family Offices, which uh, Dr. Simon O'Leary started a few months ago. So uh, it's a very interesting coincidence that we have a research center now, we're doing this series, and we're doing other events and so on. And Simon is here today, and I'm very grateful for that. Let me just go over to Ron. Ron, I've known Ron for many years. We tried to figure out how long. He was in banking, I was in banking, he was in hedge funds, I was in hedge funds. And uh, now we're looking at ventures together and some other opportunities. Ron has a very illustrious career, and he's going to tell himself about his career. Uh, <laughs> but he, he, prepared, he prepared a very interesting case study that, uh, uh, of which you've seen the material which I uploaded, which he's going to speak about it. It's a case study he actually prepared for Stanford University where he got an MBA, and he's going to tell you all about that. Uh, perhaps the first 30, 30, 40 minutes, and then you can ask questions. And we finish up by four o'clock, okay? Okay, Over great. To, uh, um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Simon, and thank you, Jacob. Uh, as Jacob mentioned, I've known him for a long time. We've worked together on and off. Um, what I want to do today is uh, give you a little bit of my background, which is a bit eclectic, um, but it might help you if you're in different areas and you're wondering should you go into a startup or try something different because maybe that's not your field. I think the answer is it's okay. Um, as long as you have the drive, enthusiasm, enjoy the people you're working with, and you think you have a good idea and, and you want to take it forward. It's, it's really, it can be a lot of fun, uh, it can be a lot of work and I'm going to point out some of the benefits and pitfalls as, as we kind of go on today. Um, so first I'll go through a little bit of my background. I want to review the case. I want to review the case in a slightly different way. And I, um, When I say that, when I originally taught this case, which was about 18 years ago, and that was in the executive program at Stanford, and it was a much longer case. It was about 40 pages. It had, a, it had 28 pages of exhibits, and uh, it had a B case, uh, which is how the cases are written. You sort of have the A, the challenge, and B, actually what happened. And the learning takes place sort of in between that space. You finish the A case, and then you say, what would I do, and how would I do it? And then you actually see what happened, and you see whether or not it's the right way to approach things, and what lessons you can learn from that A case, if you will, to bring forward into your own own lives and your own businesses and your own interests. And by doing that, you learn from other people's mistakes. Or you learn different approaches that you might not thought might not have thought about. And all that's going to be important as you want to move forward. Because I can tell you right now, as you go forward, you will be with people in some kind of a team. You're going to have to manage that process. You may have an idea, you want to build the team. Or you may have a team that's successful and you want to take it forward and make it bigger and better and maybe even make a business out of it. All of which means you need a skill set. And that skill set is much more, much more diverse and uh, sort of much more important than I think most people might have thought about 20 years ago. However, one of the things that's interesting about the case, and as I said, I've given you a, a, an abbreviated version, is that a lot of the metrics the way the case was put together, and it, a lot of it was drawn from the business plan uh, specifically uh, because I knew, uh, I knew Richard very well. And the plan itself, the financials, the way you calculate things uh, in terms of revenue, impressions per click, number of people on the page, this was all new territory in the late 1990s. That was really kind of the start or early days of the internet. And people were still struggling with that. And it's very interesting to see that it's, that was put together then as a case and as a business plan in the late 1990s. But not a lot has changed. A lot of people use similar formats in their financials today. 
uh, in terms of their assumptions for the number of people who are going to be on the page and for how long, et cetera, and how they're going to monetize that. That's, you know, sort of a basic now. But back then, people were saying, how do, I, how do you make money out of this? And it was an interesting time and an interesting world in the 90s um, to be starting up a business, number one, but to also be doing it and working together with some people that, uh, in, in this particular case, uh, when I talked to Case, people at Stanford and, and the way they were looking at things, and also the way they look at it today. Um, so I'll take you through my background, as you can tell by my accent, I'm not from Yorkshire. Sorry, um, my grandmother and uncle are from Yorkshire, actually. I grew up outside of New York. I did my undergraduate at Yale University. I entered Yale as a studio art major, so I had ceramics and drawings and everything, and by my sort of sophomore year at university, I realized I was okay, but not great, and I liked it, but I didn't have a passion. And those are two things you really need if you want to do something well. You need talent and a passion, certainly in creative arts. Didn't have it, but I had curiosity, so I ended up as a history major. Fine, I wasn't a lawyer, I wasn't a doctor. Afterwards, I actually traveled to South Africa and got a job working on docks, then boarded a freighter, worked my way east and west African coast on a freighter, back to New York, spent a year on Pier 5 in Brooklyn loading container ships, and then happily took an MBA acceptance at Stanford where it was warm and there was no snow, and I was much happier. So that was a lot of fun, very interesting, and this was a while ago at Stanford, but one of the things the school was, interest, uh, was interesting about the school and the way they taught things, and this is a small program, it was about 310 people at the time, it's about 400 now, uh, is that they really encouraged people to look at small, they called it small business. They didn't call it entrepreneur, entrepreneurship or startups, all of which they call today, but they call it a small business. And everybody wanted to be in the course. It was the most popular course at the time. And I remembered that. It was always in the back of my head as I kind of, kind of tried to find my way in the more corporate world, because we all have to earn money, right? So after, after uh, business school, I went to work uh, briefly in banking, and commercial banking. I was in Venezuela in the Dominican Republic. Realized I hated that. Uh, thought I liked more of a creative flair. Went to work in advertising for five years at Young and Rubicam. Great accounts in New York, um, but didn't pay. That's the problem with advertising to some degree. Unless you're at the right slot, it doesn't pay. So you've got to look at a job on Wall Street, which is what I did. So I moved to banking, uh, spent most of my career with J.P. Morgan. They transferred me to London. From London, I went to Switzerland, then back to London. And I stayed, in essence, in finance. But I stayed there because I had the opportunity to do a lot of small things in an entrepreneurial fashion within a large infrastructure. I could build teams. I could start new businesses. And I liked that. And one of the things that happened in kind of the late 90s, uh, as I was at J.P. Morgan, uh, is my father was very, very ill. Um, he was diagnosed with renal cell kidney cancer. And as you can tell by now, um, I am Richard in this case, so I, I wrote it and lived the case very well. And this was terrible. I mean, he had a, a six-month prognosis, not going to make it. So what do you do at that time? This is the nascent days of the Internet. So you get online. I'm here. I'm in London. My father's in North Carolina, miles away. So I get online and I start looking at hospitals, I start looking at doctors, I start looking at their pedigree, I want to see the number of times they perform certain surgeries, I want to learn all I can about renal cell kidney cancer. I just dove into the internet and used it for as much as I possibly could. And sure enough, <laughs> over a period of time, I was able to find the right doctor, the right hospital, eight hour operation, uh, my father was 82, he lived to be 96 very active, he outlived his surgeon. So I realized the internet had the power to really harness things. If I could find the doctor in the United States from here, learn all about it, and make the correct decisions, <coughs> there's a way you can put this together for healthcare. So that gave me the idea for Medica as a business. So I put together a group, very uh, talented team in the late 90s, 
and put together our proposition. And I have to say that Medica was uh, well ahead of its time. It was a broad view on health care that is only being replicated today in silos. For instance, at that time, we were talking about a 24-hour helpline request online for the NHS. We were talking about video di diagnosis <laughs> using video cameras or, and video chats with GPs. We're talking about drugstores online, so pharmacy to you. That idea was all part of it. Uh, we looked at um, resourcing, uh, information. So we looked at um, things that WebMD would do today. And then there was a back end side to it, too, in terms of supplying the trust with orders and order processing. That was kind of a, that was sort of a next stage uh, workout on that. So it was extremely ambitious. Couldn't be done. It was ahead of its time. The horsepower wasn't there. The technology just wasn't quite there. Uh, the belief wasn't there. But we had an interesting team. We had a great proposition. If only one of those things worked, that was great. So what happened at that time was effectively, as I put together the case, we raised five million sterling in 1998. And that was a phenomenal amount as seed capital for three people plus we're going to hire two others. Imagine five million coming in the door. Wow, I can, I can get an office, I can get equipment, I can hire a team, I can start traveling and get strategic partners. I can actually make this all happen. That's that. Then there were some other issues that came out of this, which I'll, I'll come to in a minute. Um, as uh, as moved forward, and I'm going to come to the present today, uh, I did stay in banking. I, continued after Medica. Medica did not happen. It's the reason I wrote the uh, case for it, because I was so angry about it. Uh, but I've kind of retaught that case in smaller ways, because the learning from that case has become incredibly important today. Now, I've pretty much, I can't say I'm finished with finance, but I've, I, I've been still, still to some degree active in it. But I now work more with Stanford. I work in their Ignite program here in London, which is for startups. It's a degree program. It runs for nine weeks. I am one of uh, five mentors, and we are asked to, we get parachuted into teams, we give them advice, we tell them, this isn't going to work, where did you get that idea? Or, great idea, move it ahead, do this, you should be doing that, you should be doing that. And we try to get them to the point where they can do a pitch to a VC and they can get money. And that's it, and that's, think about that accelerant in nine weeks that you're going to do this. And that's what, that's what happens. You come out with a perfect pitch on this thing. You're taught your elevator pitch. You're taught your, how, how your financials have to be. You're taught how to make a rock solid um, economic case for your model and to take it forward. Um, all that is excellent. And I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. And I'm still working with three or four teams that have spun out of that, as a matter of fact. Whether they go ahead or not, don't know. Still in the process. But one of the key things, I think, about Medica, and I'm just going to uh, move to that case now, uh, away from the picture of uh, happy me on the beach, um, is to talk about it. Uh, everything in there is factual. Everything happened. Everything um, came up to the point at the end of the case where we just received the funds. Imagine that. You get a great letter, five million sterling, yours. Yours, hey, there's good job, you know. You're spending that thing, you know, <laughs> you know, open it. Wow, it's like a, you know, you go around, what can I spend it on? What can I spend it on? To make the business work, because you're in there for the business, right? You're in there, you got the team together, you're gonna work. And then suddenly, suddenly, you get one of your team members, one of the three quote unquote founders, gets up and says, I want double my equity. I'm worth more in this group. And if I don't get that, I'm leaving. And that's what happened. Sat there, I looked at it. I s <laughs> what? Are you crazy? It's five million here. There's lots to do. There's a great opportunity. But they said, well, I want double. What are you going to do about it? And so that was the question. That's the A case. What do you do? when you have a team member that does that. And guess what? There's 
better than a 50-50 chance that you will have somebody do that to you. If you have a startup, you have a new business, or you're on a team and you want to take it to the next level. 50% of startup teams fail because of group dynamics, and that's today's fact. And today's fact is that Stanford University, the business school, now is a full-time professor that does nothing but teach group dynamics. And basically, how to build a team, how to run a team, how to manage a team. Because otherwise, your great idea, your great funding, your great partnership is zero when the team falls apart. And I have examples. This is a couple of months ago this happened to somebody who I met at one of these startup meetings. He had a fabulous idea. He said, this is great, I'm going to shop it around, it's, a, it's in commercial insurance, da da da, whatever. And I said, yeah, that sounds really interesting. And he said, yeah, I got everything, the I never met any of the other team, the rest of the team was around somewhere. And I met him again, and he said, yeah, we're getting close. So he, he received 10 million <laughs> in startup funding. So we're talking 10 million. Imagine that. I thought I had five, that was great. This guy got 10. Whoa! Fabulous. Two months later, I get a call. I'm out. What? He goes, the team kicked me out. I said, but you're the founder. He goes, I know. He got kicked out. They voted him out. And the VC that had provided the money now has this little category of what they call zombie investments that they're missing the key person or they're missing one of the key people. They funded it and they desperately, it's like it's a, it's a workout situation on one of their investments. So that's money that they were really excited about behind an idea that they're really excited about. And this guy, he's out. You know, he's kept a little bit of equity. They had to work out some kind of deal. He had no idea that his team would kick him out. And they did. And this is it. This is how important it is. So what can you do to prevent that? What kind of steps can you take? And that's really the lessons of what I would say is going to be the big case on this. So I'd like to hear from somebody in the class, if you have a situation like you have at the end of this case, where one of your team members suddenly wants more equity or they'll walk out, and you recognize that your lifelong, or lifelong, your, your three-year idea or two-year idea, which you've been wedded to for that period of time very intensely, and the money's behind it, and you can realize it, but it's in jeopardy. What are you going to do? What's the next step? You're sitting there with the rest of your team, you're looking at each other, and you go, huh, okay, what do we do? Anybody have any thoughts? Just throw them out. I don't care. I'd like to hear it. What do you want to do? Do you want to give her the equity? Do you want to approach her? Go ahead. Uh, maybe to find a different solution. Maybe we can compromise on, on something. Maybe a higher uh, profit margin or profit comp compensation as soon as the business then takes the start starts. Or try just trying to, to prevent that, that that her she leaves, and you can start it. And as soon as it work, works out, then you can figure out a, a way a way to satisfy the needs of his own partner. Yeah, I think that that's a that's probably a very good idea for, you know, a reaction to something that you hadn't anticipated. And this way, by sort of scaling it off into the future on the success of the business, you tie her into it. It buys you time to decide and her to think about it, but you'll get rewarded for staying on longer uh, to an increasing, uh, increasingly large degree, assuming that the business is successful. That's, that's one way to do it. Um, anybody else? Other, uh, yeah. Um, just kick her out and find a find the, the her keep out and find a different uh, partner. Who yeah, that's because nobody is ir 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 irreplaceable. Well, that is that's correct. The um, that's another option that you know you're kind of jammed because in this particular case, everybody's working so closely together, so intensely that to rotate somebody in, not only would they have to fit in the team but they would have to meet the um, criteria of the investor. 
and the investor would wonder about a new person coming in, what's causing this, et cetera, and they'd be reluctant to probably provide the funds either right away or in the size that they had, that they had said. They might come back and structure it, so we'll give you one million here, and then you know the person stays on for that. So they may restructure that. Uh, anybody else? Any other ideas on what you would do in a situation like this? I mean, just throw it out. You can, because uh, there is another alternative. There you okay? Fine. Let's, let's throw it out. Next. Yeah. Um, since you said that the VC company invested in those three, three people, and I, I wouldn't do it, but if the VC company is so. Uh, Fund of those three, uh, founding um, team members, it might make sense to go to them again and listen. Say, listen, one of our team members has changed their mind. We were trying to keep them, yeah, to trying to keep them aboard. How much are you willing to um, to cooperate to keep this person on, on board? Yep, that's a good approach too. Uh, you could ask the uh, person who's threatening to leave to talk to the VCs, and then, but also tell the VCs what's happening and. Maybe they structure a deal that keeps her, and that's an, that's an option. You know, you're, if you're going to get rid of her, that's one thing. If you're going to and find somebody else, that's a potential option. If you're going to restructure what you're going to offer so that she stays on, that's another. Third is leveraging the VC, which I think is a good good approach to that. Um, what's interesting in this particular case is that. I think your first idea was actually what we thought of. And I'll tell you, if we go to the, uh, sorry, those are the financials, which are worth, worth looking at because I, when I went over them, I thought, geez, you know, they were, they were sort of ahead of their time in some ways, but, uh, or, or that they haven't changed too much. Um, the B case here, basically, we used the idea of providing her share options based on performance goals in the company. So in other words, if we hit a certain metric and a growth metric, she would get more shares. And then another growth metric. So we basically used your first idea to see if that would work. Idea number two, where we might get somebody else, I actually think that that's, that's a lesson learned. We didn't have anybody else in mind because we stayed there um, with her and we were working so intensely <laughs> together and, and seemingly so on board that we didn't think this was going to happen. That we thought, why would anybody leave, especially when the money comes in? But the, the problem with that is that as soon as the money comes in, people change. And so she's no longer that easygoing, fun, I'm going to work hard, let's get this to work. She's like, I'm going to get richer than you. And that was her attitude. And it just brought out a whole other side that we didn't see in this person. And that, and that is a, that's a problem when you have a team and you're working uh, very closely together. So anyway, what had happened was um, she wanted cash. She wanted money up front. She didn't want to stay around. I mean, probably what she wanted was more equity. She would stay around, let's say, for another six months till the money started being invested and she could crystallize a little bit of her share opportunity or the valuation on her shares and try to, try to do a partial sale to somebody else. We don't know. No idea. She left and apart from talking on the phone, don't know what happened to her. She stayed in, in the health field and, and continued. Um, I had uh, working, again, this was actually another Stanford person I was working with who was uh, uh, Pierre who said, well, listen, you're managing this wrong. I can manage it better. This is such a great idea. I will find other VCs to fund us, even without her. And I said, well, you know, we need that person. That's a, that's a, you know, a key part of the team in terms of their relationships in the healthcare world, et cetera. And so it, it is built, all of us bringing a different type of value to it. And this went very quickly. As soon as you put money on the table, everybody's true colors show up. And, and you need to be able to manage that process. And that's a bit of what this is about, managing that process. And I eventually, or eventually, meaning within two weeks, 
I left the firm. I kept, I kept share options. I didn't keep shares. I kept options. As soon as I left and Josephine left, the VCs took their money out. And then you had Pierre and Jean-Claude, who was another doctor, marketing the idea. And they couldn't raise anything. And so that was it. It basically closed down. It, would, it became effectively a study in failed group dynamics. And I'm going to get into group dynamics because of how important that is to anybody that works in a team, anybody that has a startup idea, anybody that wants to take um, you know, whatever group they're working in wants to take that idea forward. And you need to know about group dynamics before you get into the situation that I got stuck in. So, five million sterling, never cashed, VC's gone, great idea, no horsepower, couldn't sell it without key people to, the, to any other VC's. I was so angry about this, I said, well, I'm going to write this as a case study. And I'd written a couple before for Stanford, so I went out, talked to some people at the university, and they, they gave me a, a guy as a mentor, a guy by the name of um, Heim Mendelssohn, and he's noted in the case. And Heim at the time was a, an assistant professor at the business school, at the GSB. Today he's a chaired Kleiner Perkins professor of electronic commerce at the university, so he stayed there and done very well. And a fun story after I finished teaching this class and this particular case in the executive program is being driven back to the hotel in 2000 with Heim. He's driving me back, so I'll give you a ride to the hotel, thanks. And we're driving along in Menlo Park, and he says, do you have a few minutes? He said, see that gray house? I go, yeah, yeah. He said, I'm, I'm consulting for some guys there. And I said, you know, he says, let's stop in and see him. You really would like it. The four guys, and they're working on this cool search engine. And I'm like, I don't have time. No, I don't want to do this. I got to make a phone call. So there are the four founders of Google in that gray house working on their search engine, sitting in, you know, in the living room and doing whatever they are. And uh, I gave it up. So what could I say? But it was a fun time to be in Palo Alto. Wrote the case, taught the case, and basically kept those ideas, specifically now in what's referred to as group dynamics. And that's so critical because, as I mentioned, 50% of you who have a new idea, who have a team, who want to take something forward, who want to build a team, whatever you have and you want to do, there's a 50-50 you know, chance somebody's going to screw it up for you. Maybe even you. I mean, it could be that guy who was talking to me about the insurance thing and was so happy and pleased with himself. And probably the other founders kind of said, God, he's a jerk. Let's get rid of him. We got the money. And they managed to. But in doing so, they shot themselves in the foot. He's not doing anything. They're kind of that zombie investment, and they're probably looking for a new leader for that right now, the VC team. And the same thing happened here. I mean, I left, the money left, nothing happened. Penny basically sunk the team. What could I have done differently? Well, some very good points made earlier here. Lessons learned. Let's get up here. Functional, harmonious team in a startup. You might say, how difficult is that? The answer is, it's really difficult. Where are you going to get a functional, harmonious team? It almost doesn't exist. You need a bit of dynamics. You need some yes, no's back and forth to move ahead. But you don't need people saying no all the time. You don't need people saying you're wrong all the time. You need to be in it and have a common commitment. That's incredibly important. If you're starting a business, selecting co-founders, you're beginning to hire, this relationship is intense. It says in some ways almost akin to marriage. You're going to spend more time at the business than you are with your wife or husband because it's almost a 24-hour thing. It just takes over your life. You will experience something close to life or death situation. I mean, I went weeks not sleeping, little eating, so stressful. Power and fairness, huge issues in startups, 
huge issues. And by the way, you don't even have any money yet, and yet you, somebody's thinking that they're the best, and they're, therefore they should be the most powerful. And there's no money, and there's no business. But those dynamics come out. And you need to manage those up front, and you need to be smart about how you manage it. So how do you learn from that? Things that you can do. A clear culture and clear statement of values. Sit down when you have your idea and write. Just write down what your mission statement is, what your values are, what you want everybody to think about when they come on board as the team. You have to be aligned in this. You all have to be aligned, and that's going to be very important. That's number one, that's the number one thing. Now, saying it's a great idea and you want part of it and you want to be on board, that doesn't work. That might have worked then, it doesn't work now. Now you actually have to have that value statement, that mission statement, and you need to put it together, together, and then others that you hire have to subscribe to it. They have to say, okay, these are my same values. This is how I want to work as a team. And then you kind of minimize some of the conflicts going forward. People join because they want to be part of a team that has the same values. And that's incredibly important. If you bring the wrong person in, you don't have HR. You're going to be, it's going to be really hard to get rid of this person. And you're going to bring them in and you're going to say in two weeks, whoa, this isn't working. This guy's a complete asshole. You know? I just, why? I mean, he's great in technology, but I don't want to talk to him. Nobody wants to talk to him. Out the, you know, out the door. You really have to sit there and say, slow to hire, quick to fire. <laughs> and it's very hard to do, because you have no experience. You know, none. You're kind, of, you're kind of flying blind. But if you have the mission statement, you have the value system, that's always your navigation point. That effectively is your moral compass of your business moral compass of the team. That's what you're putting together. And as the point made earlier, have backups, if at all possible. If somebody doesn't work, be thinking about somebody who might, especially if you make the hire and they turn out to be unreasonable, to use a nice phrase, a bit unreasonable. So you want to have a backup. You want to do that work. You want to find somebody. You want to. Um, if somebody comes on board, you say, who, are, you know, who do you work with? Who are you know, your competitors? Who do you think is doing the job that you're doing at another place? And they generally will know. And that could be your backup. That's something to keep in mind when you have that interview process and you start asking about it. We know very well when we worked in finance, when you were in sales, for example, people would interview <laughs> you at another firm and they go, who are your biggest accounts? It's well, I'm da da da. And then you leave and they go, God, we didn't know that account did all that business. Let's, let's go to A. You better call. So it was just sort of a way of checking that you're covering all your accounts. A little bit at your expense. That happens. That happened and it happens. So this way you get your backup when you ask other people who they view as their competitors in the marketplace. Um, do think about your dream team. You've got to work to a plan. This is, this is another mistake that I made. I didn't hire first available. I did think of a dream team. I did know them, and I did talk to them. But at the same time, I probably could have backed off that and made one or two hires differently for the group and the team. And maybe, maybe, maybe we would have succeeded. The check would have been cashed, and we would have gone a lot further, possibly still going today. Don't know. People are as important as your product. I've already stated. 50% of you are going to hit the wall because of people. And you have to be able to manage that and manage it well because you want to make that 20%. Put those odds down so that you can go forward, the idea can get done, and you can work as a team. Super important. Look at everything someone offers. Know what you, your founding team, are good at. Fill those, complement, fill those gaps with complementary skills. But make sure everybody 
again, goes back to those core values and mission statement. Those used to be not even talked about in sort of the quote unquote early inter internet days. It was always great idea, large funding, let's see it work. And you know, the Silicon Valley is littered with wrecks of billions of dollars of things that just off the cliff. And a lot of it is people driven, 50% of it people driven. Values are what motivate you and your team. You don't want to compromise. You don't want to bring somebody in and says, hey, I don't like that. Now, because you spend some time on it. So as soon as you're working on your concept, who to go to, what the business, what the business plan looks like, who else you're going to hire, all part of that and underlying that, your values, your mission statement, that's all got to be there. You don't compromise on that. And it, sometimes it's reflected, oftentimes it says here in your product and in your mission statement. You've got to be excited and motivated. And a lot of new businesses today do that. They will have um, a mission statement. Uh, some of the new ideas that I see that spin out of Ignite do have a mission statement. They talk about what they want to do. They articulate it very well. But they still make mistakes. And I, and I see those mistakes. And I'll, I'll talk about a couple of them in a moment. And don't always hire your best friends. I know you're sitting next to somebody up there and you're talking together and you're saying, I got a great idea. Yeah, I love, love that idea. I want to do it with you. That's so great. Well, yeah. Until money's put on the table and then your best friend says, I'm worth more. Get out of here. You know, because your best friend just sees themselves. They don't, they don't see the team. They don't see the values. And that's what you want. You want, you want somebody who will understand the values and is part of the team. And that may not be your best friend. Your best friend might be somebody to talk to and to share ideas with, but probably or maybe not a good team member. So that's so all I can say. I can tell you that the other two founders weren't my best friends. And after this fell apart, they were certainly not my best friends. In fact, one of them I didn't see for seven years afterwards. Um, hire somebody as a compliment. If you're risk prone, hire somebody who's a little bit uh, risk adverse. You want somebody to offset. You want a check and balance situation. It's very, very important. And again, these are these are learning situations here. Pessimist on the team. Uh, I go back and forth on that. Somebody who offers a contrarian point of view is better phraseology. You want somebody who says, well, maybe that's not the right idea. But then you want them to say, here's a better idea. I don't like people who just say no. It's very easy to say no. You want somebody who says no, but, or no, try this. So you want somebody who will kind of spar with you, but will offer an alternative that you can, you can then consider as a team. Very important. VCs, mantras, hire slow, fire fast. Same for startups. Um, harder to do than say. Very hard to do. Couldn't do it in, in, in my situation. It was just too much straight moving forward. I probably should have taken more time and effort and done a lot of these checks and balances early on so that I wouldn't have hit the wall. <clears throat> Lastly, startup, it's like a marriage. It's emotional, it's financial, and you don't go into it thinking it, you want it to end at all. So you gotta take your time, ask the questions, vision, values, product, desired culture. Does the person work on all fronts? Can you offer them that position knowing that you've got somebody who fits in the culture, fits with the values, and fits with the ideas that your other team members have subscribed to? You'll have many less problems and much more chance of success because then you will have lowered that 50% odd to a 20% odd that you'll hit the wall because of a team member. And you don't want that. Nobody thought of it 15 and 20 years ago. They just thought, let's get going. If it breaks, pick it up and try it again. But no, there's too much competition out there. VCs are much more sophisticated. You're not going to get money unless they really like your team. Like the idea, like the value system, and think it's unique in the field, and they're looking to put money in that particular area, because that's going to be important too. VCs, I mean, you might be in retail and they don't want it. You might be in 
um, social media and they don't want it because they already have investments. So you're going to have to shop VCs just like they will shop for you. And that's all important and part of it. But if you've got the team right, most other, other things will flow from that. I didn't have the team right, um, but I certainly learned a lot from that. And I can tell you today, these same issues continue. If I look at some of the teams that, are, uh, that recently have spun out of the Ignite program, for example, there's one that I like. It's in the healthcare area. It's, um, it's a disintermediation play between the NHS and the doctors they're recruiting. It's a very simple, easy to understand proposition. Doesn't require a lot. Very good, smart guy doing it. Probably will get some funding, but right now it's one guy. His team that took it through the end of Ignite, they went off to do other things. Somebody went off to do AI, somebody went off back to their um, uh, Deloitte, somebody else went back to do other things. So it's just him. And so he's kind of using some of his money and kind of running this on, hoping for more money. He's not going to get money unless he has a team. And he doesn't have a team. And I met with him a week ago and I said, you're great, the idea is great, people want to give you money, but they're not giving it to you. Go out and find people that you can work with on the technology side, on the marketing side, on the resourcing side, and come back with a team, at least two other people, and then you'll have a very good shot. And you can make this happen. Let's see what happens there. I have another team. And these are true stories. These are happening right now. One that I like, um, they're in social media. And they've done a very interesting and quite powerful app. I don't know if they're going to take over the world with it, but they might get acquired because they are in a unique space in social media, and I've not seen anybody else in there. They have raised successfully 400,000 pounds, and they're in test stages right now. The problem is they've been in test stages for almost a year. They're not out there. They haven't, they have, they haven't captured an audience. Nobody's going to acquire you unless you have things that they want to acquire. And as far as your intellectual property, huh, hello, a couple of other people can probably come in and replicate this pretty quickly, especially when you're funding them from the likes of the Facebook, for example. So there's a lot of cash to go into that. So what he needs to do is basically get out there, forget the testing phase. I mean, he's on beta seven or something. Forget it. Just launch it. Figure out that your audience is the beta phase, and they can do it for you, and just get that audience, <coughs> capture it. Otherwise, he's going to have a hard time going from his 400,000 to his 1.5, which he wants to do in June and July. That's, that's an active true story. Nice team, good group, interesting space, too slow. That's a problem. Uh, another team, very interesting. Uh, they are uh, a spin-off of a very large media company. And they have an interesting idea as a subset of that media space. And it really was driven by one person in one of the teams that I um, basically mentored. And that one person had an idea that I thought was a great idea. And it, he had a reasonably captured audience. It was a subscription model but I could see where the money was going to come from. And in fact, when he presented to VCs, people, VC said to him, your, your cash assumptions, your revenue assumptions are too low. You can make twice as much in this model. So he's beaming. This is two years ago. It took him a year to get the licensing. It's taken him another year. His parent company offered him several million as seed money. <coughs> he said, oh, I'll take this. They wanted half the business. I said, well, you have got a big problem here because they're giving you a lot of money. They're taking half your business. You're going to be working for them forever, and it's not going to make any difference. You're not going to make any money. They're going to drive <coughs> your business. You aren't going to drive your business. What you want is a smaller amount of money among diversified investors. So he went off and was able to raise 
half a million, which it just closed, I guess, uh, at the end of January. Uh, and then he will go from there for sort of the next round. Sadly, he's raised half a million within that same kind of overall umbrella of, of um, interested parties. So I'm not sure he really escaped the true problem that he was going to have, giving 50% away to, you know, his his uh, uh, his original um, group that he spun out. So these are things that are being worked on right now. Are some of the problems he has? It he got another person as part of his team. He has more credibility. That person has credibility. They've known each other a long time. That's he's solve things that way. You have the medical system, it's only one person, he needs to have a team. So there, you've got to look at that, you've got to think about that. You can't go, one person, one idea, you're not going to get money. Third, um, the media space, good team, good idea, raise money, too slow to execute, I think now. Can he get it done? Find out. I'll see him again in, a, in another week. So these are some active live ideas that are happening now. They all spin around originally, your startup, your team, your value system. They all have different bells and whistles to them. But unless you get the right people, you're never going to get the level that you want to have a successful team, a successful business, and a happy, and a happy life because you do not want to work in a team where you don't like each other. I can tell you that. It's more stressful than anything you can imagine. So, this is all about how to reduce that 50% chance you hit the wall down to 20. And if you can do that and follow some of these guidelines, you're ahead of everybody else. Because the 50% chance that I'll hit the wall at 20, you will, you got it made, especially if you're competing. Anyway, that's it in a kind of nutshell, very quickly done. Uh, more than happy to take some questions about your business, your ideas, your team, whatever, what you're thinking of doing, or whatever. So I leave it open to the class. Go ahead. So any questions? Any questions? I have a question. Oh, right, yeah, go ahead. So what is the question? The question is, I think you, hello, I think you explained very, uh, I think, uh, eloquently is the, the, the question of the group dynamics and having a team and how important the team is. Um, it seems to me that obviously the bigger the team, the more complex these dynamics are. So does it make sense that perhaps the team is smaller, perhaps instead of having four partners, just having two partners, and the other members are perhaps junior partners, or not even partners, they are perhaps working on a commission basis, working on a salary basis, so keeping the, the core smaller and having less, uh, uh, eliminating yeah, I mean, risk uh, itself. You do, um, even with one other person, you're going to have a risk. You know, that, that dynamic is there. Um, I tend to like sort of, kind of a, let's call it a, a threesome partnership type of thing because then you can kind of get over a block where you and one other person argue about something. I do agree it's very important uh, and, it, and generally you have to at early stages outsource a lot of things. So you don't, don't make all the hires, you keep it small and, and especially if you're working really well and you've gotten the funding together, the VCs are going to look at the team. The team is the most important thing to them. They'll love the idea, you know, they'll, they'll come to you for the idea. We like the idea, it fits our basket. We're putting money into insurance today, or we're putting money into, you know, auto tires today, or whatever it might be. And then, okay, your idea is good. Now let's see the team. And by the way, the VCs may be, may be able to offer that extra person or persons as an introduction to you to kind of complete exactly. your team. Yeah. And that helps, because then you have somebody on board that the VCs are really happy with, and they'll leave you alone. Because the last thing you want is somebody who's, who gives you money and wants to be there every single day and call the shots. So I do think it is a good point not to expand the management team quickly and everybody's- Beyond three. Yeah, beyond three. I mean, 
one is not necessarily the right way to go, but you know, some people do it that way. You know, they're they're successful at it, but um, that's a rare case. Uh, but I do think um, you know how you manage it. Manage it not at a, at a rapid pace, but at an incremental and thoughtful pace. Good. Any questions? Anything? Yes. Uh, Luca. What do you think about the alternative method of funding, such as ICOs, for example? Do you think they're reliable at VCs, or is it already that's still an like experimental? Oh, you mean if you wanted to, you know, for companies that want to do ICOs, for example? Like, instead of going to VCs, like doing their own ICOs. Oh, as an alternative way of funding. Um, you know, that's interesting. I don't, um, uh, it's kind of, it's almost in its own way like crowdfunding in, in its own way. I mean, uh, different in, in some sense of the word. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't know enough about the market, although I have seen some companies that have funded themselves through ICOs. Um, I don't think the window's going to be there forever to do something <laughs> like that. And that's also including a regulatory window. Uh, so I'm guessing if you can do it, uh, and it's reasonably cheap capital for you, go ahead and do it. But I do think that that's going to be one that's going to be up in, in, in bright headlights of regulatory issues soon. So it, it's an alternative way of raising money. But it also depends, because if you're doing it then, you're not, you're not getting the expertise of um, strategic expertise that you might get from a VC. You might not get the networking that, that they might be able to provide, and you might not get the talent that they could introduce you to. So if you just need cash, it's probably not a bad way to go. If you need cash plus, which generally you want, then it's back to the VCs. Good. Any other questions? So we're almost at the end. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. All right. Fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.